Uh, my name is Matt. I'm part of the team here. We're starting a brand new, we're kicking off a brand new series called The Comparison Trap. And listen, you know, it feels kind of like to use the word trap with the word comparison, it feels kind of weird, doesn't it? I mean, it feels kind of wrong to use the word trap with comparison because if I was honest, and maybe if you were honest, man, comparison feels, well, so natural. Comparison feels so normal. Comparison just kind of happens. It, it's kind of like just something that we're really good at and that we do. Matter of fact, comparison is something that I do on a daily basis. I wonder if comparison is something that you do on a daily basis. I wonder if comparison is something that we all do on a daily basis. Matter of fact, I would go as far to suggest that the world's newest pastime is comparison. And here's what I mean. If you don't believe me, don't believe me. Listen, listen, just the next time you go out in public, look around. Like, have you ever been standing in line? Do people talk to each other anymore? No, no, no. What are people doing in line? They're, 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 lo- they're looking on their, on their phone and they're looking at their Instagram or, or their Snapchat or their Facebook feed. Like, have you ever been out to a restaurant, right? And you go somewhere and there's like a family of four and you expect them to be talking, but they're not talking. They're all looking out there. Right? And then if they're not looking at their phones, they're, they're taking a picture of their food to Snapchat to their friend to say, look what I'm eating, right? Listen, have you ever been to an airport? Like, if you have ever been to an airport going somewhere, what are people doing? Are they talking? Are they getting to know people? No, no. They're checking their feed. They're, they're looking at social media. I think comparison has become a worldwide pastime. And it feels awkward and weird, but it's something uh, that we all do. Matter of fact, recently, like th- this happened to me, like just this past week. Matter of fact, this Tuesday, I said, you know, I'm going to go to, I haven't been on Facebook for a while. I'm going to go check my Facebook feed. So I went onto my Facebook feed to check my Facebook and I was bombarded. I'm telling you, like just every post was the exact same thing. It was the first day of school pictures. I mean, they were so adorable. It was so cute. It was like puppy dogs and angels and unicorns and rainbows. They, all the pictures were really so cute. And I immediately thought this thought when I saw all these pictures. Here's what I thought. <coughs> I thought, man, am I glad that my kids aren't little and they're not in that kind of school anymore. Because listen, listen I'm going to give you a little example. Here's, here's a picture of what most of the pictures look like um, on Facebook, right? Hey, here she is. Look at that smile. She's got a great smile. She's all dressed. She's got a little matching like book bag, right? And, and they got her name and the school and her age and what her teacher is and like favorite things and the date. Like this is, this is really great. And I looked at that and I said, I, that's not what my kid looked like. You want to know what my kid looked like when they went to school? We didn't show a picture of what my first day. <laughs> all right, like there was no way I want to compete with all these pictures. I was like, man, for me, when my kids went to school, I was lucky if they had some of their school supplies, part of a lunch, and if they got to school on time, that would be great. Know their teachers' names. Man, I saw somebody, they had a picture of their kid and they had a little gift, and someone said, what's the little gift for? And they said, oh, it's a, it's a gift for their teacher on their first day. And I went, I want to puke. Now, we should give gifts to teachers because they put up with our kids all years, right? Right? Like we, we should, like teachers are worth it, right? And, but like, man, I, I can't compete with that. I don't want to compare with that. I was like, man, that's ridiculous. Have you discovered that it seems like everywhere we go, that comparison seems to just happen all by itself. Think about, think about it. Like you're at work, right? You're at the work and you're like hanging out and someone starts telling you about your vacation. You've already had your vacation. Your vacation wasn't the greatest, but it wasn't the worst. It was a good vacation. You are really happy with your vac- vacation till your coworkers started telling you about their vacation. And when they started telling you about you, their vacation, you started thinking, man, my vacation was lame. And they go on and they go on and they go on. And then you want to just stop listening to them and you're mad and they wonder why you hate them and you hate them because they had a better vacation. And then you go home and you yell at your wife and your kids because your vacation that you thought was good is now lame because you compared it to someone else's great thing. I mean, it's ever happened. Am I the only person that's ever happened to, right? Like, matter of fact, maybe maybe it goes something like this, like this. You did a remodeling project and so you put it on Snapchat and you're, you look at your friend Snapchat and they did a great job on the remodeling project, but man, you feel bad because like you can't do remodel stuff. You tried once and then your wife had to hire someone to come fix up your mess and like you don't even, you don't even try to do it anymore. You just watch the eye shows because you can't do it. Might as well watch somebody else do it, right? And and so then you, you feel bad about that. Have you ever been, like, listen, you go somewhere for a party, right? It's your friend's party. They got promoted. And if you ever been to a party where someone's got promoted, everyone's trying to one-up everyone. Yeah, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And yeah, we're doing this and we're doing that. Like everyone's telling about how great they are and they're trying to one-up each other. And you're sitting there listening to this and going, 
why am I so lame? Like, why, why, is my, why am I so far behind everyone? Why, why is my life not as good as other people? Maybe, maybe it was an office party. You know, you have that one person in the office party that whenever like you have a party, they bring the best food, you know, to eat their food. Like if I bring food and it's from a wife, you eat it. If I made it, I wouldn't eat it if I was you, right? And so like you always have that one person that brings something, right? And they always bring the best cake, the best dessert. And then when somebody eats it, right? And you get mad every time because everyone brags to them. Oh, thank you for bringing that. Oh, it's so good. Can you bring more? And you have trouble boiling water and it just makes you, makes you, makes you mad, right? And maybe you go to visit your friend, right? You have, you have friends, they have a kids, this little kid birthday party and they got like four kids and you show up to the house and it's clean. You're like, what is this clean that, I, that you speak of? Like, how is your house so clean? You've got four kids and it's so well decorated and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the pictures on the wall are actually their family. Back at your house, you have eight loads of laundry and the people in your picture frames are the models from the store that you bought it from. Man, it gets worse. I mean, you run into an old friend and they have a new snazzy outfit and you're like, man, how do you have such style? Or maybe a, a, someone posts on Facebook about their kid. Their kid is summa cum laude or whatever at the school that they're going to or they're this athlete and your kid's a champion at video gaming. And you go, like, what did I do? How am I parenting? And it seems like if we were honest that everywhere we go, all the time, every day, everywhere, we are comparing. And comparing and comparison seems so natural and normal that we forget to ask a really important question that we want to ask today. With all the comparing that we're doing, is it helpful or is it harmful? Does comparing ever really get us the results that we want? And here's the scary thing. Our addiction to comparison blinds many of us to the truth that we already know and we can already see. And so today we want to ask a question, does comparison really help or really hurt? And here's, what's, here's what was mind-boggling to me. As I began to do research, it was clear and obvious right from the get-go, the answer to this question. But here's what surprised me about the information about comparison is it didn't come from like a spiritual or church background or a pastor. Matter of fact, most of the research that I found in comparison came from the secular world. Matter of fact, as I was doing some research, I came across this article in Psychology Today. I'm going to read it. And again, Psychology Today, not secular, not Christian, but here's what they have to say about comparison. But comparison can be harmful when they leave you feeling chronically inferior or depressed. Now, I want you to remember this. Comparison is harmful when it leaves you in, in feeling inferior or depressed. Remember that, because when we get to the end of this, you're going you're to see something says, that was the case well before the advent of social media. So what they're trying to say is, listen, comparison, when you compare on a regular basis, listen, you're going to feel inferior and depressed. I mean, you don't even have to look at social media. But now that there's social media and they go on to say this, it's a turbocharged precision instrument for social comparison, unlike anything in human history. Our ability to Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook everywhere we go and see everyone's stories is unlike anything in human history. Part of its uniqueness, researchers point out, is that it paints a heavily skewed picture of one's social universe. What they're saying is, is this isn't reality. It's, it's, it's framed wrongly. And they go on to say this. They say people are most likely to share a peak experience and flattering news about them. No one, no one, no one posts like, I'm getting thrown out of my office. Watch this. I'm living this. They're carrying my stuff out. I'm going to Snapchat, me getting, you know, like getting pulled over to get a ticket. Like, here's the meal that I burnt and no one wants to eat in my family. Like, no one does that. It's what University of Houston psychologist Maile Nugent Steers calls everyone else's highlights reel. I love what Pastor Stephen Furtick says. says, we judge our life by our behind the scenes and compare it to everyone else's highlight reel. But they didn't finish there. They continued to go on to say this. This narrow, disordered slice of reality that is displayed on social media is almost, listen to this word, perfectly constructed to make viewers feel. Remember what it said? If comparison causes you to feel less and discouraged, it's harmful. It's perfectly constructed to make viewers feel deficient and discouraged. And it's just not psychology today. The research continues. Matter of fact, there was an article in Huffington Post. They said this, they quote Mark Twain, and we don't know where Mark Twain got or if he was the original one. It says, Mark Twain said that comparison is the death of joy. And science agrees. Listen, this isn't some made up idea. It says the research has found that comparing breeds feeling of envy, low self-confidence and depression. Oh man, let me sign up for that right there, man. Ooh, let me get on that bandwagon. 
Like nobody should jump off that. Research has said that, listen, when we compare, it breeds envy, low self-confidence and depression, as well as it compromises our ability to trust others. They go on to say this. He says, while downward comparison, comparing ourselves to those less fortunate can provide some benefit to one's son's self, even this form of comparison comes at a price. They go on to say that, they go on to, that it requires that we take pleasure in someone else's failures or misfortunes in order to feel adequate, which can fuel mean-spirited competitiveness versus collaboration. And they go on to say, Jealousy versus connection when comparing leads to, to you devaluing yourself and others, you've entered a dangerous territory. And it's not just a Huffington Post or Psychology Day. Matter of fact, there was another article in Psych Central. Uh, it came from a, a, this. Oh, I like this. This part, no, you can go back. That was good. Don't let me forget this. If comparing is how you evaluate your worth, you will always be. In this game of life, you will never reach a point where you are better than others in every area or in every way. And why would you? Psych Central goes on to say it this way. It says, many of us regularly fall into the bleak, bottomless pit of the comparison trap. I've been there. Anybody else? Making comparisons can further ignite low self-esteem and depression and damage our relationships because of jealousy or poor communication. And here's a truth that we've all already experienced. You already knew the answer because you've experienced it. I've experienced it. We've all experienced it firsthand. And it's our opening truth this morning. You didn't need to come to church. You didn't need to read an article. Here's the truth we've all experienced. We always lose when we choose to play the comparison game. We always lose. There are no winners in this game called the comparison game. Everyone loses. You lose, I lose, we all lose. If you choose to play the game, you lose. Now here's why we always lose in the comparison game. Because it's a setup. It just doesn't work. Listen, here's why we always lose. Comparison always has the wrong view. Whenever you and I choose to compare, we'll always see with the wrong view. Here's why. You can't see the whole story. Listen, you can't see that. Listen, I bet all of us know people that we used to look up to or people who said, I wish I had their life. I wish I had their this. I wish I had that. And then years later or some point later, the, the true story comes out and you go, oh, whoa, whoa, I really didn't want that. And here's the reality. You can't see the whole story. And then everyone else is unique. Everyone here has their own God-given story that only you are meant to live out. That's why when we compare, we'll always lose. We never win when we choose to play the comparison game. And this is why I'm a grateful follower of Jesus. That's why I love God, Jesus, the Bible, the Holy Spirit. Listen, listen, God knew. God knew that in every generation, in every culture, on every continent, in every season, that people would struggle with comparison. And so God addressed this way before social science confirmed what you and I already knew. A matter of fact, comparison is such a trap that even the disciples who followed Jesus fell into the comparison trap. A matter of fact, we're going to start this whole series off by looking at one of the chief disciples, Peter. He fell into this trap. Now, before we take a look at how Peter fell in this trap, I need to set the stage for what happened. Peter was a follower of Jesus. He was a fisherman. Jesus called to follow him. Uh, Peter followed Jesus for three years. He saw Jesus get crucified. He saw Jesus buried. Uh, Peter showed up uh, to his tomb and saw that the tomb was empty. And then Jesus showed up to Peter resurrected. Now, you and I can disagree on what the empty tomb means, but here's the great news this morning. Regardless of where we've been, what we've done, or where we're headed, we can be forgiven and life can be found in a person named Jesus because he overcame hell and death and paid our sin debt. So Peter was following Jesus. The problem was is that on the night that Je Jesus was betrayed, Peter was standing by around a campfire and someone said, hey, I think you're a follower of Jesus. And Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. So when Jesus is resurrected, he shows back up. The boys are out of the fishing boat. They go, we don't know what to do. Jesus is gone. We know the tomb is empty, but what do we do? So they went back to fishing. They went back to the thing they were doing, but they weren't catching any fish. And all of a sudden they heard a voice on the shore cry out to him, hey, have you got any fish? And Jesus responds. Uh, they respond, Peter and, and the fishermen, they go, no, we don't fish. So Jesus, they can't see him because he's far off and it's kind of early in the morning. He says, why don't you throw your net on the other side? So they throw their net on the other side. They catch so many fish. It's like the very first miracle. They realize it's Jesus. So Peter and John and the rest of the disciples come up and Jesus is having a conversation with Peter. And this is where we pick it up. Here's what Jesus tells Peter. Then Jesus told him, follow me. 
So Jesus looks at Peter and says, listen, 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 you have a God-given story that only you can live. So I need you to follow me. Listen, wouldn't it be great if all of us in this room could get this? Listen, let's stop worrying about what everyone else is doing and just worry about us following Jesus. Like, wouldn't would the church be awesome? That might be too much. We'll keep going, right? So Jesus tells Peter, listen, I know you deny me, but here's what I need you to do. I need you to follow me. Only you can live your God-given story. Peter turned around and he saw behind him the disciple Jesus loved. Now, isn't this interesting? that John is the author of this book, and John describes himself humbly as the disciple Jesus loved. So humble and gracious you are, John. Great, great that you describe yourself as the disciple that Jesus loved. So Peter turns around, he sees John, the one that Jesus loved, the one whom he leaned over to in Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? That, that one, that was me, that was me. He's being very shy here and very, right? And goes on to say this. Peter asked Jesus, what about him? So Jesus looks at Peter and says, listen, you have a God-given story that only you can live. Follow me. And so what does Peter do? Peter does what we all do. He stops, he turns around, and he looks over, and he, says, he looks at John and says, well, what about him? How many of us go through life and go, what about them? Or what about her? Or what about him? What about them? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. You see, Jesus is telling Peter a very simple truth. You can't live another person's story, Peter. No more than John could live your story, you can't live his story. And if you try to live his story, you'll always fail. You live the story that God has given you. Why worry about his story? It'll just rob you of the life that you were meant to live. Now, over the next several weeks, we're going to take a look into this. And, and, and kind of the way I give sermons is it's really long. I, I love to talk, and I, I give long sermons, so people kind of go, how does this thing work when we kick off a series? And, like, if I was going to give my whole sermon, it'd be about five hours, and no one would want to stay. And so what I do is I take my one really long sermon, and I break it up over the weeks. And over the next several weeks, we're going to look at comparison and some of the things that it has to do, and we're going to keep going. But this morning, I want to do something a little bit different, a little bit simple as we kind of kick this thing off. I want to make three observations that I think I've observed from life and in from Scripture uh, about kind of comparison so we can have an honest assessment of what comparison does in my life and in your life so we can realize how dangerous comparison is because Jesus says, listen, don't do it, follow me. And so here's my first observation this morning for comparison. Comparison can be a cruel taskmaster. Comparison is a cruel taskmaster for yourself and for others. And here's why comparison is a cruel taskmaster. Listen, we all know this, you've experienced this. As soon as you compare, it creates feelings inside of you that you didn't know were there. I mean, how many of us have compared and felt this? We're gonna put it up on the screen. Comparison often makes us feel inferior. Man, look, look how pretty she is. She's so much prettier than me. It makes us feel insecure. He's so much smarter. It makes us feel inadequate. Oh, if I was only like fill in the blank. When we compare, it always says, listen, look at what they have. Look at what they can do. Look at, look at that, and I don't have it. And so it makes us feel inferior or insecure and inadequate. And living a life where we live out of being inferior or insecure, or inadequate is a horrible way to live. Because if we're really honest, no matter the good deeds that we do or the production or no matter how far in life we get, if we live out of being inferior and secure and adequate, it's really all about, really because all the things we do are to say, listen, I want to prove to myself in the world that I am not these things. So life becomes all about me to make sure that I am who I think I should be. Even if I do good things, it's really just to make sure that I'm all that I should be and I'm gonna do these things, not really for you or not really for God or not really for the world or not really to fulfill my story, but so that I can feel good about me. But there's a flip side of this and we've all been on both sides of this. Comparison can also do the opposite of this. Comparison can often make us feel superior. Huh. Oh, that's cute. Look, look, you tried that, isn't that cute? Like, huh. don't you wish you were like me? <laughs> Like if people were just more like me, they would be like, it makes us feel superior. We feel invincible, man. Look at me, nothing's gonna conquer me. Mom, you know, I'm so smart, I've, I've saved, I've worked. Like I'm invincible, nothing can take me on, right? We feel independent, I don't need them, I don't need her, I don't need God, I don't need the child, I don't need anyone. I got this. We look at others who maybe not might be where we're at and go, man, stinks to be them. Look how awesome I am. And the problem is this is all about me. And here's what we know. 
Whether it's on the inferior side or the superior side, it's still all about me. And you'll never have healthy relationships when life is all about me. You'll always have dysfunctional relationships with your friends or your spouse or your coworkers or family because you can't give what you don't have. You see, comparison is a cruel taskmaster if you live out of inferiority. You're always hard on yourself, it's never good enough and you're always living in fear. And it's a cruel taskmaster if you think you're superior because you always treat people without compassion and without dignity and you always think you're better than them leads us to a place where relationships just don't work and aren't healthy. Which, and you know what? Here's the great thing. God speaks this. There's great news. Whatever side you're on to this, God speaks this. Matter of fact, I love what King David said. It was written in the Psalms and, and God recorded this because he wants you and I to know this. He says, listen, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I want to stop here for a second because I grew up in a rough environment. My mom died when I was young. I went to go live with my, my biological dad um, and, and I, didn't get, I didn't get to hear a lot of nice words. And so I never grew up thinking I was fearfully and wonderful made. I thought I was, grew up, I was busted and broken and I was what's wrong, wrong with the world. And I want, I know some some of you here in this room, whether you're watching or listening, no one ever told you that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And so I just want to stop right here in this moment. And I want to say something to each and every one of you that regardless of what your mama, your daddy, your grandma, your coach, or your teacher said, that you were made in the image of God and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That you were made in the image of your heavenly father. Your works are wonderful. You're a wonderful work. I know that full well. And he goes on to say this. He says, your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days ordained for me. They were written down in your book before every one of them came to be. The author is saying this. He's saying, listen, I'm made uniquely. God made me wonderfully and fearfully. And not only did God make me wonderfully and fearfully and uniquely, God has a story, a destiny that only I can live out. Every day was ordained in his book. Every single person here, regardless of their challenges or their limitations or their upbringing or their intellect or their money or their culture or whatever has happened in their past, you matter deeply to God and you have a story that only you are meant to live out. God is looking at you and I and going, listen, their life might be different. Your life might be different. Different isn't bad. Different is just different. You can't live someone else's story. I can't live someone else's story. God has a story that only we can live out. Which leads me straight into observation number two that we're gonna put up on the screen is, comparison often leads to behaviors that harm ourselves and others. And listen, listen, think about this. When we compare, when we start getting the comparison, we go on Facebook, we go on Snapchat, we look at the paper, we go to school, we go shopping, we go to the hairdresser, you know, we go to the gym. I mean, the gym is the worst place, right? I mean, when you go to the gym, every, nobody in the gym is ever happy. I'm too skinny, I'm too fat, I'm too tall, I'm too short, too much hair, not enough. Like, I mean, it's just ridiculous how hard we compare ourselves. But listen, when we compare, it often leads leads to behavior that harms ourselves and it harms others. Listen, there's a response to comparison that almost all of us have. And we're going to put it up on the screen. You need to buckle up, bing, right? Because no one's going to like these things on the list, but it's all true. Here's what comparison leads to. We covet. Look what they have. Now, just buckle up. Here it comes, right? Like, I wish I had a wife like he did. I wish I had a husband like she does. I covet. You, you don't know what they got. Right? I wish I had... I deserve, I want, I need. See, when we compare, we go, listen, I wish, I want, I need, I deserve. And anytime we start using words like I wish, I want, I deserve, I need, we begin to take shortcuts. And if you want to see what's busted and broken in the world, it's people coveting what other people have. And they'll take shortcuts to get it. Competing. Instead of living in a world where I go, you're my friend and I am for you. We live in a world where we compete and you're my enemy to be conquered. And I don't know how Christians could live like that because the very thing that Jesus tells us, to love God and to do unto your neighbors as you love your neighbors yourself. How can your neighbor be your friend that you're for if they're your enemy to conquer? 
We live in a world where we get value by competing. And we go, you're not my friend that I'm for, you're my enemy that I'm gonna conquer. We see this all the time. We see this in the business world, we see it in church, we see it in middle school, all oh, middle school, don't we wanna forget that? We go into complaining, man, America, America win a gold medal in complaining, right? We, we throw away food, but we complain. When we compare, we complain. Listen, listen, I have a, I have a nice little house. Like it's not, it's not a mansion, but it's not a shed, right? Like I have a medium, like nice little house. But you know, it's amazing. I've been in other houses and go, man, I love my house. My house is great. And then I go to other houses and I go, I hate my house. My house is so horrible. Why well, I live in that trash dump? And I begin to complain. And here's what happens when we compare. We begin to complain. It's never enough and we're never satisfied. And so we just complain. Complain, complain, complain. Never focus on helping other people. Never help focus kind of on living out a story. We're just in complain mode because we covet and we compete. And then we go on to chasing. We go on to chasing the world, chasing vanity. I'm gonna ask the world. I need to chase. I need to, but whatever your ladder is, I need to climb up the ladder to get the applause of people who wouldn't spit in your ear if your brain was on fire. I mean, think about it. Isn't that what we do when we chase the world? Please tell me I'm good enough. Please tell me you like me. Give me the applause, vanity. Think about it. Comparison leads to these four things. Do these four things have anything good in them? And you know what they're driven by? They're driven by the emotions that we feel when we compare, which are this. Coveting, competing, complaining, and chasing are all driven by jealousy and, let's say that one more time. Chasing are all driven by Now, let me ask you a question. Are those good motives? Listen, before social science told us, hey, those things aren't going to work the way that you want them to work, God's been telling us for a very long time. Matter of fact, in the Bible, in James, the letter James wrote to the church, he wrote these words inspired through the Holy Spirit. He says, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, jealousy in me, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Listen, if you want to know why there's dysfunction in a relationship, if you want to know why relationships are busted and broken, if you want to know why there's evil and busted and brokenness, it all comes from jealousy and selfish ambition. It wrecks us. God tells us, listen, if you and I have behaviors that are driven by flawed motives, if you and I have behaviors that are driven by flawed motives, it will hurt our lives and it'll hurt the lives of others. And then thirdly, about comparison, the third observation, comparison comes with a hidden cost that no one ever wants to pay. A little bit of confession time. Comparison is probably one of the hardest things I've struggled with most of my life and still struggle with this day. And when I say comparison comes with a cost, a hidden cost that no one wants to pay, I am telling you from experience. Matter of fact, you want to know what are these hidden costs that we pay that when we, are, we stay addicted to the habit of comparing? Well, here's what happens. It robs us of our happiness. We were happy until we saw someone else was happier than us or had something nicer. And so now we're no longer happy. When you live in comparison, you can't be happy because it's never enough. You're never satisfied. You're going to complain. You're going to covet. You're going to compete and you're going to chase. Man, just can't ever be present in the moment to be happy to enjoy where you're at because we're comparing it to someone or something else. Comparison will cause us to miss out on relationships. Do you hear what it said? It causes you to not trust. When you're, when you're insecure and, and, and feel inferior and adequate, you can't reveal yourself. You don't always have a mask on. So how does anyone truly know you? If you feel superior, invincible, and independent, you never really need anyone. So you don't ever really connect because you don't need them. So that when you and I live in this comparison, we're always missing out on significant, deep relationships. And then lastly, it robs us of our destiny. We look at someone else's story that we think we'd want to have, but we don't know the whole story. So maybe you really wouldn't want it, but we think we want it. And so we try to live someone else's story. And there's a problem. You can't live someone else's story. The only story that you can live is your story. And so when we stay stuck in the comparison trap, it robs us of our happiness and our relationships and our destiny. And God loves you and I so much. He penned these words early in scripture so that human beings would understand, listen, don't fall for this. Do not fall for the trap. 
You have a choice. Here's what he writes in Hebrews. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Comparison is a weight that slows us down. It doesn't allow us to run and finish our story. It boxes us in. If I had to sum up what I was trying to say in the last few minutes, I would put it this way. Comparison is a trap that robs our joy and ruins our relationships. Comparison is a game that no one wins. When you play the comparison game, you'll always lose. Comparison will rob our joy and will ruin our relationships. I know this firsthand. Been one of my greatest struggles through my life. I was thinking about what to share to kind of close this up and talk about how comparison is a trap that robs our joy and ruins our relationships. And I was thinking, um, there, there's this hero that I've had in my life for the last probably 20, 20 plus years. Um, it's a person I've looked up to. And, and if I was really honest, I would look at you and, you know, if I was just blatantly honest, I'd go, man, if I could be somebody, I'd want to be that person. Like I would, this person, they're a pastor. They wrote books. They got asked to speak at speaking conferences. They've done amazing things. They've traveled the world. They, you know, they just have a church that's transformed their community. I go, man, what would it like to be an awesome person like that? And I've judged my whole life around, what if I could live that story? Here's the problem with that. I can't live someone else's story. I can only live my story. Now this person's story and ministry came to a 40 year end as they retired. And, and like all retirements, as people write books and tell stories, uh, they tell stories about this person. And, and there's some things that came out that I'd go, oh, their life was, was not what I thought it was. Because you never win in comparison because you don't always have the whole and when parts of the story came out, I go, oh, thank, thank God, I don't want that to be my story. And I spent years not being grateful to God and not enjoying where I was because I was comparing my life to someone else who had a different story. When I should have heeded the words of Jesus, what is it to you? You follow me. So as we go through over the next several weeks, our hope and our prayer is that you and I will not fall for the comparison trap and allow it to rob our joy and to ruin our relationships. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you before social science told us what we already knew, that God, you knew we'd struggle with comparison and you don't bash us for it. You give grace and you love us and you give us instruction to point us to help us to not compare. God, wherever we've looked to someone else and not done our own story, God, we ask for forgiveness. God, I pray for anyone in this room or watching this. God, if they don't believe that they're fearfully and wonderfully made, God, would you speak to them and let them know that they are son or daughter of the Most High and that you have a story that only they can live. God, thank you that you love us enough to give us a story worthy of our life. God, help us to escape the trap comparison so we won't be robbed of the joy and have our relationships ruined. God, help us to escape it so we can live the life that you died for. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you might be asking, well, if we're not supposed to compare, what do we do? Well, great news. I'm going to answer that next week, so come back. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.